ka ola no Hawaii. Papa mua ia mana kula a anenalo, ke maa hua hua hau mai nei i kei pai aina. I ka maka iki umiku maiwa kane hiku kuma walu, ua lilo i o lelo ku helu o ka moku aina me ka o lelo perekane. Ola no ia mana mele, i ka no hona ka ma aina, mana puke a i loko na kula e hoa mua wana i ka ike o iwi. Ka o lelo Hawaii, hoa maka ano ka hoa ola haola me ka hoa o ili ola o Insights. Ma PBS Hawaii. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. Only 50 years ago, the Hawaiian language was on the verge of extinction. There were still a few kupuna who spoke it, but they were the exception, and the language was not part of school curriculum. That changed in the early 1980s with the emergence of the Hawaiian Immersion Program. Now, Olelo Hawaii is flourishing, and so too is Hawaiian culture. Our guests tonight are all fluent Hawaiian language speakers who have their own thoughts about how far the language has come and what may be next. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guest, Charles Manu Aikohano Boyd is known as, better known as Manu Boyd, is a cultural consultant with Kamehameha Schools. He's also a kumuhula, a music composer, and has won several Na Hoku Hano Hano Awards. Christopher Kaliko Baker is the is an assistant professor at the Kawai Huelani Center for Hawaiian <laughs> Language at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He also has written several plays in Hawaiian language. Amy Kalili is the director of the Moku Ola Honua Global Center for Indigenous Language Excellence. She is also the Hawaiian language voice on public address systems at Honolulu Airport and a founding member of OEV TV. And Kamale Krug attended Anue Nui Language. Hawaiian Language Immersion School from third grade through 12th grade. She is currently a freshman at UH Manoa majoring in Hawaiian language. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Mahalo. I think we're going to have a great discussion and I want to start out on somewhat of a personal note. I'd love to go around the table and hear how each of you came to speak Hawaiian language. Let's start with you. Yeah, well, well um, you know, we're surrounded by Olelo <coughs> Hawaii in, in Hawaii. Our place names, street names, our music, we hear it everywhere. And when I was a, a young kid, uh, you know, going to my grandmother's house in Kapahulu, um, she didn't speak Hawaiian, but she was, she was born in 1895 in Kohala, mm -hmm. and from a time where we were just surrounded by those things. By the time I got to Kamehameha, I, I ended up taking Japanese for four years. <laughs> so, yonen, nihongo, benkyo, shimashita. <laughs> but, uh, but, but after, um, you know, and becoming more involved in, in music and hula and mele in particular, because mele is the foundation, the uh, Hawaiian poetic composition of the hula, of the chant, of our, of our uh, genealogies and all that. So uh, it, it, it was a little bit later, but I'm, I'm so glad I did, and, I, and I'm, I'm happy now to share that experience with others. Amy, how about you? Um, well, similar, um, obviously, to Manu, um, I didn't grow up speaking. Um, my grandparents' generation, and of course, prior to that, spoke. But for me, and I, don't, uh, I would say for a lot of people who are similar to me in age, it was a choice in high school and or college to just take Hawaiian. So I took um, whatever the requisite amount of classes were to take for a foreign language in high school at Kamehameha, but it was when I ended up at UH Hilo that I started taking Hawaiian language and had the opportunity to, I was too old to be a part of the immersion program, but was fortunate to be involved in some of the supplemental programming to what was taking mm -hmm. place in terms of curriculum development or just immediately being able to engage with the Punana Leo in those environments where Hawaiian was being used. And so I kind of attribute my fluency to that is not only taking it as a class um, as a young adult, but having those contexts where I could jump in and actually use it. Um, yeah, that I'm very thankful for the opportunity and for the people who started to do all this stuff many years before mm -hmm. me that had the opportunity to do that. Hi. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, where to begin? So I, I'm a proud Castle High School graduate and yes. Hawaiian language, even though there was a course, a Hawaiiana course, I mm -hmm. believe there, 
and some of the some of my cooler friends were in that course in that course <laughs> of study. I was had other things that I was preoccupied with. We could say that. Um, so, but when I got to UH Manoa, University of Hawaii Manoa, uh, one of my first classes that I took, and I'm glad I did, it was Hawaiian language, and I enjoyed it so much that by the end of the semester, end of the first year, I told my professor, my instructor at the time, I said, Elilo on the kau hana yau. And she thought it was cute, but you know, so I wanted to, oh, oh I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna take your I'm job. I'm gonna take your job. <laughs> and I said that just be. I'm the one person who does not speak Hawaiian, and uh, I think there's probably many in our audience. <laughs> there's probably many are in our yeah, uh, yeah. audience as well. So. But we're looking at your job too. <laughs> we're looking at you. And you don't want the cow on the Anyway, Hawaiian language lessons for today. So anyway, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really, and then I enjoyed taking other Hawaiian language courses, so I decided to major it in. And it was real, I was lucky because I was the early 90s. And there was still a pretty good pool of native speakers left. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to have hui uh, meetings on, on Oahu with native speakers. And we saw the, the professors would always bring them in for us to um, spend time with and develop our skills. And so we we're very fortunate at Manoa to have that and um, you know the, the sorts of expertise that I was able to just surround myself with it. It, it, it was easy to you know it was easy to fall in love with the language and stuff so you know growing up growing up Hawaiian you just you don't you, in when I was going to high school it was one of those things where you're just like oh we should mm. speak Hawaiian but you know more important to uh, not get Put in jail, <laughs> you know. As Castle, I went to public <laughs> high school, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the good. To, the, realities the realities of things of is, you know, yeah. is that's one of the things. So it's, I, I was very lucky to make it into college mm -hmm. first, and then when I had that opportunity, I was like, oh, I was going to do what I want to do. I love the language. I'm going to do the language. But Castle High School is awesome. So just for the rest of you, yeah, there, I, you are from you know, <laughs> Kane Oye, yeah, you know, it is. It's pretty. It's a pretty good school. I mean, we got the very it's successful. Good for, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I guess. Yes. Well, you come at, at this from a, a totally different place because you were fortunate enough to grow up speaking Hawaiian. Tell us about your experience. Yeah. Um, so my family was, oh, my parents were like them. Um, they weren't taught the language mm -hmm. from birth and I'm lucky to have been raised in a language. Um, yeah, it's just been a part of my life since birth and I don't know how to live without the language. I mean, it's just a part of me. and. I'm lucky to <laughs> speak the language that my ancestors spoke for thousands of years. Um, and yeah. So growing up, um, you know, I'm just curious about how this works because we, we live in a culture, obviously, in a community that for the most part speaks mm -hmm. English. Yep. So if you're growing up speaking Hawaiian at home, are you speaking English as well or are you only speaking Hawaiian? Um, well, between my parents and me and my siblings, we only speak Hawaiian. Um, I knew how to speak English. I mean, I wasn't taught English like like grammar and everything until fifth grade, but I knew how to speak to my grandparents because they didn't know how to speak the language. And But pretty much everywhere um, my family went, we would just always speak Hawaiian to each other. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so this is sort of open to the floor, but what is it? How is it different? I know that anyone who speaks a second language sort of mm -hmm. has this feeling that when <clears throat> there are words and phrases and emotions even that you can communicate in a, in a, another language that you can't speak in English. So when you were able to master these, this language, um, what changed for you? Were you able to express yourself in a deeper way, in a different way? I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I don't know about mastering the language at this point either. Um, but there, there, you know, uh, when you are involved in, 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 in music and hula in particular, or, or, or hakumele composition, and you are, you are weaving words together that actually have emotion already built into them, and you learn how to embody them, that's really, it's, it's a tricky part. I want to um, uh, veer off from that question because I wanted, to, I wanted to, uh, to, to, to really kind of uh, acknowledge Kamalays and, and all of our situations. You know, in, in the, the late uh, 19th century and the early, tw early 20th century, where you had uh, one, two, or three, or even four generations of, of, local, of people living in Hawaii, Hawaiians in particular, who weren't even able to go home and speak to grandma and grandpa. You know, so that's where the emotion lies. You learn that from the kupuna. 
And so if you weren't able to even have a conversation with your grandmother because you were not able to speak Hawaiian in school and only learned English, I think a lot of that, that human um, expression and emotion was, was really lost. So you're trying to, and I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know English grammar. So I don't know if grammar is really important, but I, I do know emotion. But to, to get to your point, if you are able, because now we, we, you know, when you hear the kids uh, uh, fighting in Hawaiian or, or uh, laughing in Hawaiian or making jokes in Hawaiian or standing up proud and, and giving a, a ha'i olelo, a speech in Hawaiian, it's, it's just amazing because it's so natural. But we, we didn't have that, the experience that Kamale did to actually be interacting with others. We were already uh, in college, high school or college. Yeah, when you were learning, was it difficult to find people to practice speaking with and, and having that kind of community? Because I would think that now, you know, as we said in the open, there's a whole generation that have grown up in these immersion schools, so there are many more people to talk to. Right, I think there were dependent, you know, maybe what Kaligo was talking about too, with whether it was hui kama ilio or going back to you know, my personal experience and just having, literally having spaces where Hawaiian was already being used. So yeah. a lot of, I think, a lot of people who took language in high school might have either had opportunity or would actually go to the Punanaleo preschool to volunteer or to just be in and around that context, to find context where Hawaiian language was actually the language, the dominant language. Um, and for myself, working at Punanaleo and in the offices there, it was an example of a business that was actually, you know, you'd walk into a regular administrative office and everybody mm -hmm. in the office is speaking Hawaiian. So um, I think there were those contexts and if you could tap into them, you were fortunate. And that for me is actually what cultivated, I think, a sense of fluency. And one other thought about Kaliko said, being around native speakers, I think for me, there's this, um, I don't know, I think there's this threshold you hit when you're learning languages. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is true because I've only learned one new one. I'm mm -hmm. working on some more. <laughs> but th like, you can know all of this stuff cranially. Yeah. Like, I knew a bunch of words and I knew a bunch of patterns, but then you- No, there is a threshold. Right, and then there's you that, kind of freak that out. Poo, like, that actually, hill, you get right over where it. Where you it's just all of a spit it out of your mouth. Oh. And it, for me, it was being around native speakers. All and right. a, a, there, I remember there was this program and it was a bunch of like Ni'iho youth and who obviously their first language is Hawaiian. And even if they could speak to me in English, their English wasn't really strong either. So I think it clicked in my head that, okay, in order for me to actually engage with these people, and it was a job, I was doing something. In order for me to actually do my job, I'm just gonna have to get over this. And just, I don't know. <laughs> Figure it out. I don't Figure know. it out. It even. might be you know, backwards and words all in the wrong place, but I'm sure they'll, you know, hopefully they'll bear with me and we'll get through this. But it was, Literally, I think it was that summer, and then I yeah. just kind of crossed over that threshold. So I think those were two things, you know, is that there are, were and are contexts where you can hang out with other people that really want to try to allow Hawaii more than not. And that allows you to get over that hump mm -hmm. where you're just like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, I'm cool with this. I can do this. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, it's achievable. How is it different now? Um, how easy is it to find people that you can speak with? Well. I, hmm, that's a great question. Um, I think it, it's much easier now because mm -hmm. the numbers in the population mm -hmm. of speakers of Hawaiian has grown tremendously over the last 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. however long we've been doing this. Yeah, so w it's far more easier than, say, in 1990 or in the 1980s, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. where you know, you'd be far and few to find the tutu that could speak Hawaiian, where now you can, there are schools where there are children, there are teachers, and then there, um, there are little pockets in the community mm -hmm. where that, that speak Hawaiian mm -hmm. or throughout the islands. And I think the, the best uh, sort of testimony to this is, uh, like, uh, as, as Kamale has been raised in, in Hawaiian, so we, my wife and I, have raised our children in Hawaiian. And with the sort of strict regiment, similar to um, Kamale's re raising. And so we only speak Hawaiian to our kids. And when we go to the store, we speak Hawaiian, of course. Um, and, you know, sometimes we'll make jokes about people <laughs> walking around <laughs> us. And the best thing is, you know, sometimes I still. Sometimes you're going to find people you who get understand. Busted, yeah. You just stole my thought <laughs> <up. laughs> 
So anyway, yes, exactly. Yeah. So well, since, you, you when, gotta since be careful when, now. Yeah, you gotta be careful now because you might be walking by and there might be a speaker and then you make a joke about some speaker and they'll be like, oh, oh yeah, popo, popo, yeah, yeah. Oh, I understand <laughs> why, and, you know? And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> you know that I was just teasing you then. And that's fine. That's a, good, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> it's it's yeah. a great yeah. problem yeah. and yeah. I'll be yeah. embarrassed like that every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just as a, just to tell, just so that we know that we're progressing as a Lahui, as a people, mm -hmm. and as uh, and that is a Lahui, a people who know how to speak their language mm -hmm. and have um, and are reconnecting to our past in that way. Tell us about the experience of going to one of these immersion schools. You're learning all the subjects in Hawaiian, mm -hmm. and you're learning English as a second language as just that. Yeah. So you know. Um, are all the kids in, in a, you know, from similar backgrounds? Is everybody living in a home that all the parents are speaking Hawaiian? How how does that work? Uh, yeah, that's probably one of the I don't know, problems or like the difficult the difficult things about Kaiapuni because not a lot of the families raised. There are only like a few. Mm -hmm. Like for my class, it was pretty much only my parents knew how to speak Hawaiian. So that's difficult for teachers to teach kids too because like. They only spend six hours a day at school every day, five days a week. But like, from birth to mm -hmm. kindergarten, they only speak English, mm -hmm. and it's harder to teach because English is already their first language and is yeah. the language that they speak all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to learn. Like for me, I'm lucky. I know, and it's, school is easy for me, but um, I feel like learning the language at school is harder to become very fluent in it. Like, it takes a long time to be fluent in it because that's not the dominant language at home. And I feel like if, oh, I know, that if parents, like, speak Hawaiian to their kids at home, it'll be easier and the children's language will be stronger because they've learned it from birth then. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's and that's, the, a, that's mm -hmm. a huge commitment for it the is. family. In fact, just yeah. comment on that too, and I, and I want the, our, our audience out there to understand that there is a clear reason or a number of reasons why we don't speak Hawaiian today. And none of them are really good reasons, <laughs> but they're historical reasons. Fine. So I ask you out there in the audience, for those of you who have been to Japan before, or been to Tahiti before, or to France before, wouldn't it be odd to go there and nobody speaks Japanese in Japan? Nobody speaks Tahitian in Tahiti, and nobody speaks, you know, French in France. And that's our experience today. Luckily, we hear Amy, you know, uh, on the, <laughs> on the, uh, the sound, yes. uh, the, the, the sound system. <laughs> but no, but I, I think it's really important to, uh, to, uh, to understand that uh, this uh, effort, and thanks, Malo Anui, uh, Ika Nui o Nakupuna, I, uh, I Au Amai, I Kolako Olelo, that, that, the, the, to the many elders who held on to that, and to people in particular, like Larry Kimura, who was my, my first Olelo Hawaii teacher at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, who uh, really maintained this Kaleo Hawaii program where native speakers were, were able to call in and, and share their stories. And there are many years now of that program that have been recorded uh, to remind us of that. Um, I also want to want to comment that uh, you know we're at, what I what I like I'm seeing around uh, Hawaii today are different pockets of not just people speaking Hawaiian but trying to bump it up, trying to raise the level of Hawaiian, and it reminds me I, I, I mentioned this at a at a recent uh, forum that I'm reading now I can we can we can all read Hawaiian language newspapers from the 19th century from uh, 1836 all the way to the World War II billions of, of words of Hawaiian on millions of pages, but uh, can understand that. But they're, but they're oh, I'm, I'm talking with my hands, I aren't I? Carry on, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but but that, that you know, understanding now, and that's part of that threshold of, of getting over. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's taken, um, and, and mahalo to those who came before us to get to that point. But my point there was that even in the 19th century, there were there were elders writing into the newspapers because mm. if we think just the, the, the back of the first section of the newspaper where we, uh, where we have all the letters to the editor and all that, people wrote in and talked about everybody and, and they were concerned in the 1860s about the, about the shallowness of the Hawaiian language at that time. Yeah. In the 1860s, during the reign of Kamehameha the, the fourth and into Kamehameha the fifth. 
So we're not only trying to reclaim a language and say, oh, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. We're trying to get to it. And luckily, our, our uh, kupuna embraced the palapala. They embraced the pencil and the pen and the paper and wrote things down that we would never have known because of those generations when Mo'opuna, grandchild, could not even have a conversation with Tutu, grandma and grandpa, because they didn't speak English and they didn't speak Hawaiian. Well, to your point about you know the depth of a language, mm -hmm. languages are always evolving. We know that Webster's, for instance, put the dictionary puts out you know a list of new words every year that have been adopted into the mm -hmm. language in, in English. So, who is the arbiter of that in the Hawaiian language community? Um, how you know as the language evolves, as you know texting becomes a thing, and um, I don't know, new technologies are invented, and you need words for that. Mm -hmm. Who, 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 you well, know, natural, who's the word on that? <laughs> in, in, a, in a natural language setting, mm -hmm. the community comes up with that. Right, we all do that collectively. Right, we do that collectively. Well, what's unique about the Hawaiian... Garen's bull baron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what's unique yeah. about the Hawaiian, Hawaiian language situation is that we have a lexicon committee mm -hmm. that makes words for everybody and everybody, and, and generally the population subscribes to those words. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that's the intention of the lexicon committee or not, once you put words into a book, they become, they, they, they take on a, mana. yeah, they have that mana, that, that sort of power. So it's, a, it's an authority. It's, it, it's, is that it's, through it seems like it's the university? Or how is that? It's mostly through UH Hilo, I would guess. Yeah, but they have members from throughout the yeah. Pai Aina, the archipelago. Every year? Yeah, they meet more than every year. Or? and they, It's more than a word list. It's a, <laughs> it's a big book. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the book is called Mamaka Kayo. And uh, I believe there's a mechanism now to update words on the. Uh, be, through technology. Lots of technology yeah, words, technology science is, words, yeah. you know, words that they, really there aren't. There's science concepts in, in Hawaiian traditional language, but... Uh, it's but not yeah, and then, and of course, the, the lexicon committee started prior to the uh, the the Palo Palo Kahiko, the traditional, the old text coming forth and being put online. So now with all this data, if you think about these texts coming up on these, the millions of pages Mother mm -hmm. talked about earlier, coming up online, um, I think it's got 100,000, a couple hundred thousand or something that's online. Um, you think about that te those texts, that's, that's actually data mm -hmm. and how, and there's so, there are so many words mm -hmm. in those texts that we can now, we can use now to talk about new things. Mm -hmm. We just change those words, which, which unfortunately were not available 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago. So, so you get uh, new vocabulary. Well, we can right. we can adapt old vocabulary for new vocabulary. Yeah. And then what we need to do is rethink what's going on in the in Mamaka Kayo, the new book. Mm -hmm. And sort of think, oh, are we gonna keep these words that were made up in the absence of this data? Are we gonna have a competition of words? <laughs> you know, and we can do that. Because mm -hmm. I mean that's what the living language community does. Right. Right? Is you you say, oh, you're gonna say um, you're going to say word X, I'm going to say word Y, and right. we'll see whose word gets liked more. And how many people how many are more we like talking buttons? about, how many people in Hawaii or, or around the world speak Hawaiian language? I, I know there is a number, I think yes. it's census data based, which mm. is obviously self-identification that's somewhere I've heard like 20,000. 26,000, yeah. 26 and a half. Um, but again, it's self-identified, so at what level that is, you know, it's up to eat that person to say whatever their level of I should mention Duolingo is. though. So Duolingo, we just talked about that as a, as a worldwide languages app for learning. It's on your phone, on your computer. And uh, just in the last uh, year, um, Hawaiian, uh, you know, our, our, our poe, uh, ho aloha, our, 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 our Hawaiian language friends had, had came together in a very short amount of time and added Hawaiian language, Olelo Hawaii, to a list of 85 languages, worldwide languages. And so language 86 and 87 were Navajo and Olelo Hawaii launched on the same day. That was in October of 2018. And so the numbers that I, I've heard is that on that app, there are actively now 300,000 people who are looking at it and beginning to learn Olelo Hawaii. So that's, uh, that's amazing. That, that's not, and, and fluency is not always the goal either. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, yeah. I think that uh, for, and here's a challenge to put out there to our, to our audience, because we have so many people 
uh, who, who are listening to this, um, this very popular show is that if you just take the time to go find out what your street name <laughs> and your place name means, everybody out there, and why do so many uh, place names begin with the word Wai or Vai? Because that's where fresh water is found. <laughs> Waikiki, Waikane, Waihole. But just your street name and your, the place where you live, go look. Go find the meaning, and that means that there will be 1.5 million people <laughs> in Hawaii who have just bumped it up to another level of understanding the Kanui Oka Olelo Hawaii, Eola Nei, Makikaya Ulu, street names, place names, music, everything. And we're, we, there's a wall because we have to take that next step, but it's not easy. We have to, this is a hard, a hard hill to climb, and we've been climbing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't think I really have done anything, really, in, 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 the, in the revitalization of the language, but my work today contributes to it. Right, but right. there are so many Besides others. being Manu Boyd, <laughs> right. the, the superstar yeah. that you are. Listen, Christopher. And, and <laughs> say my English name as much as you like. I'm still going to go on Manu You call me Charlie. Yeah. Okay. 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 I mean, you know, I mean, about, about language. Now, I don't, I, of course, this is your, you know, your, your, your <laughs> uh, really? well, I think ahead. I think that is uh, that is very valuable instruction. I think that you know it ties us deeper to the place that we yeah. that we are living in, right? Yeah. Um, so we want to involve the audience, of course. Um, some of you have been writing in. Lloyd from YNI says, "Would the members of the panel like to see Hawaiian language grow to be the dominant language in the state?" I'd love to ask you that question. It's a definite yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I yeah, I say yes because well. First of all, it was the language that was spoken here mm -hmm. first. Um, and as a speaker of the language, the language holds a different perspective. Um, mm -hmm. One of the main things, I just took a lingui linguistics 102 class, this, I'm taking one this semester. And the word order for Hawaiian is VSO, which is ver verb, subject, object. And then for English is SVO, mm -hmm. subject. and. For English, subject is first, and I think mm. that the Hawaiian language perspective is different because it was a, yes, so we is we're not thinking about ourselves mm -hmm. first, um, and that is one thing. Like um, the perspective of the Hawaiian language mm -hmm. is you take care of like you think about your actions and how it, it affects, affects everything others. everything yeah. around you. So like the land, and I think that if the Hawaiian language was was the dominant language of Hawaii. I feel like that would help us take mm -hmm. care of the land more and that'll like that'll help solve a lot of problems like global warming and overpopulation and mm -hmm. for like us not being able to be sustainable and I think that if everyone had the perspective of our ancestors, we would value the la the land more and the way we would live would be different. Like we wouldn't I feel like we would help save the land or mm -hmm. we wouldn't be destroying it, like the TMT and Mauna Kea, if everyone had the perspective of the Hawaiian language, we would know that the land comes first. So building the TMT is not gonna help the land. So like things like that and building more houses and more people moving to Hawaii, I feel like if we had the perspective, then everybody would know that that's not the right thing to do because that's not what's best for the land and not mm. think about us first like the word order. I mean, it's very interesting, the idea of, that Lloyd brings up about Hawaiian being the language of the state, um, because it, there's, a, there's a cultural question, too, as to right. who language actually belongs to. So when we think about those 300,000 people that you referenced on Duolingo learning mm -hmm. Hawaiian, mm -hmm. presumably not all of those people right. are of Hawaiian ancestry. Oh, so, not at all. Yeah, and right. so what are your thoughts on that, the, the you know, bit, people oh, who are not Hawaiian yeah, oh, learning? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, I was talking about compulsory education. Because this seems to go to that. It okay. can. Yeah. yeah, so compuls the, there was a push in Aotearoa, New Zealand, for mm. compulsory, mm. Ma Maori to be compulsory mm. within all, all schools. And then that would push Maori to every child. Mm -hmm. And then when, you, when they graduate, then you, the, the, the idea, right, is many speakers of Maori would come out of that. Mm -hmm. Now, what would that look like here? Do we even want that here? Mm -hmm. Is that I mean that's a conversation we would need mm -hmm. to have to if we if we want to see compulsory mm -hmm. Hawaiian right. in the schools mm -hmm. and whatnot. I mean I think 
a little bit of compulsory Hawaiian would be yeah. great. great. I think bi yeah, bilingual society, bilingual society, bilingual society, society, society yeah, would good. be great. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh. go ahead and take my. You know, like, uh, but although you really were first, but you're gonna be now be third. I am. I'm an okay liner. <laughs> so, Viki Viki. I just don't you know. know but it, it, <laughs> you know, so, so, so I'm third now. Yeah. Yes, babe. No, I'm, I'll be you know. <laughs> ka -ka 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 um, and then your follow-up question about the oh the cultural thing, right? So and who, I think the, the visceral the reaction on the table was that it's definitely it cannot just be a quote-unquote Hawaiian thing. If you know, going back to you know, Kamala immediately was like, yes, it would be amazing to have Hawaiian language be the dominant language in Hawaii. Again, I mean, to clarify that there was a time in our history when it was. So it seems novel now, but it's not something brand new, the concept. Mm -hmm. But in order to get back to that, it's, it's obvious that more than just Hawaiians have to speak Hawaiian. And so I think that also goes back to what um, Manu was talking about earlier. You know, those, there, it's very hard to live in Hawaii. Like if you've been here longer than a hot minute to not know some Hawaiian words, you know? whatever those things are, certain types of foods. I mean, I think there are some things out there that we say that you probably wouldn't even know what the English word is because, <laughs> right. so just even latching onto those things um, and like Manu was saying, where you live and your street names. And I also think there is, there is a certain amount of, or the onus is also on us as fluent speakers to hold on to our Olao Hawai'i and Olao Hawai'i to the extent that we can, and also have that sense of encouragement to those who aren't fluent yet, and to encourage people, you know, along that sense of use what you know, and then by all means, learn a bunch more. But I just wanted to... Yeah, I don't, I don't think, from my, in my own opinion, I don't think we need to necessarily be a Hawaiian, uh, or that we really will become a where Hawaiian is the dominant language. Mm -hmm. Bilingualism is important. Normalizing Hawaiian again, I think, is a is kind of a a, a, a concept that's happening in, in many in businesses mm -hmm. where I work at Kamehameha schools, where all three thousand employees are are required to take a language class every month and they've, for four years now, and it's growing, it's growing, it's mm -hmm. growing. But in the 19th century, when I look, look back, I'm, I'm, I'm talking with my hands again. Yes, you are. It's our, uh, you, you, <laughs> Keep it uh, up. Hawaii, Olelo Hawaii was the language of commerce. Yep. The language right. of commerce in any country, in any world, is the dominant language. And anybody who came in to do business had to learn it. When Kamehameha the Great passed away, when we honor this year his 200th, or we, we commemorate the 200th anniversary of his passing in, in 1819, he lived by, uh, side by side with foreigners for 41 years of his life. So by the time he dies in 1819 at Kamakahonu in Kona, he could speak English, he spoke a little German, spoke a little French, but he didn't really need to. He could write a little as well. But people who came here, and that's, that's in 1819, the missionaries come, when the missionaries came in 1820, that's now 42 years after Western presence in Hawaii. So English was understood, Christianity was understood even before they came. So the idea for people today to kind of freak out is like, I don't know what they're talking about. Oh, you have to have more, you have to speak more English. Well, how do you think Arkofuna felt when everybody started speaking English and they didn't know what was going on? So the, I believe, and I'm gonna quote um, uh, a, 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 a missionary, a Reverend Lorenzo Lyons. You know, he writes the, the song that we still sing today, Hawaii Aloha, as a hymn of, of, of our Aloha for Hawaii. But in his own opinion, Hawaiian Olelo Hawaii was the most beautiful language he has ever heard. And it is poetic. You know, our language, every, every word is either a vowel or ends in a vowel. So the flow, it doesn't have a lot of, you know, it has, no, it, it's beautiful. Po and the depth of the poetry and in, in, in Hawaiian mele, the, the prominence of place names and rains and winds because we have the, the rain of Manoa is Tuahine and the rain of Honolulu is Ku Kalahale and the rain of Hilo we all know Kani Lehua and all those the things, the details in, in, the, in the written uh, language 
I'm not quite done yet. <laughs> and so, in the Hawaiian language newspapers, and this is no, no, wait, one, one more thing, because I, you know, I got, I, have to, I got to go soon. So. <laughs> but, but Hawaiian language newspapers that are so accessible now, thanks yeah. to the hard work of so many people, and you read the Kuo, Kanu Pepa Kuo Koa, which means the the independent newspaper, and you see a story about Umi Ali Loa, an ancient uh, Ali Inui. Uh, from Waipi or Hawaii Island, right next to a story about Cinderella, written all in Hawaiian, and all these things about what's going on around the world. So our kupuna, we're also in the Hawaiian language, very, very uh, worldly mm. and understanding of what was going on where many people in the world were not. Because in other parts of the world, United States, countries in Europe, education was and, and literacy was only for the elite. So Hawaii, by the third quarter of the, of the 19th century, is the most literate country in the world. People learn how to read yeah. upside down, sideways, <coughs> just yeah. to see a, a, a printed paper, and they're learning how to read everything. And, and then everybody. their writing comes out funny kind because <laughs> funny yeah, kind. Yeah, because they're reading from the from the top yeah. down. Yeah. Sharing a paper. But but yeah. understanding the value of language. So that, that's an example of where we could, we were completely or almost completely uh, living in Hawaiian language. But today, I don't want we don't want people anybody out there to say, oh, if I don't speak Hawaiian, I don't belong here. That's not the the, the point. No. Right. Because you're you're right. you're surrounded by Hawaiian no matter what. Right. Well, and just learn to love it. Deborah writes in tonight. She says, what are your thoughts on commercial appropriation of Olelo Hawaii, such as the mainland firm which trademarked Aloha Poke. Now, we're not going to get into that whole right. Aloha Poke discussion, but... Um, I would love some Poke right now. <laughs> Aloha. But, um, but, oh, there, Aloha. but there is a, a cultural appropriation uh, issue. issue, for yep. sure. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you feel when you hear Hawaiian words being used, maybe, you know, for commercial purposes and things like that? I think there is a I'm gonna use it, fine line. <laughs> Did you just I say just fine said, line? Um, fine line, <laughs> fine line. <laughs> Sorry, so it's not Hawaiian. So but you're misappropriating English right now. I just misappropriated a manuism. Um, but the, I think there is a definite desire to have strategy and place for language to be used, promoted, um, and attained in industry and economy. The appropriation is the misuse of that within that context. You know what I mean? So I think I just want it to, for me personally, I think it's important that people know it's not that we don't, or for me personally, not that I don't want to see Hawaiian language used in business and industry and economy. Mm -hmm. The example you're talking about, about Aloha Poke, is a very different thing. You know, it's someone from outside benefiting economically from something that is probably not really part of who they are to begin with. And so then you're moving into this kind of really- it's an intellectual property right, issue. issue. Yeah. So again, I think there is, there is a way and you know, a process for doing that. But I think that the appropriation is an issue that needs to be addressed as a mm -hmm. separate issue from this whole idea of wanting to see Olala Hawaii used in all kinds of domains, mm -hmm. whether that's in government or economy or social services or schools. Yeah, so, right. Well, on the topic of schools, Dales writes in with a question for you, which is, should parents be concerned about their child's ability to fluently master Hawaiian and English simultaneously? Well, I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, I do everything I do so I could be a role model for the next generation. And I was raised in Hawaiian, speaking in Hawaiian, and I know how to speak English. Um, was that ever I, difficult? I do, um, at first, it was. But I think it was seventh and eighth grade, where like what they said about like the breaking mm -hmm. point, I think that was mine. But for English, mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, seventh and eighth grade. Seventh grade, I learned grammar. Then eighth grade, I learned, like, I learned how to organize my thoughts, wow. because my, well, my parents helped me, and they told me to try to write down, think about my thoughts in Hawaiian and translate them into English. And that's basically what I do. Like, like when I'm talking, I think about it in Hawaiian, then I translate it in English. And I don't, so going back to your question, I don't think it's, it is difficult at first, but I think, but if you have a strong foundation, then it's easier because for me, I have a Hawaiian language foundation. Then I went through high school and 
I got into college, and I say this, I don't mean to brag, I'm just showing everyone that right. it's possible, and I'm here to show you guys that. Right. <laughs> that I don't know why I'm my four on my, on my, four fingers on my on the table. <laughs> I, I don't know why. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I have, well, this last semester was my first semester in college, and I know how to speak Hawaiian, and I got 4.0s. Mm -hmm. First, like, that's my GPA for college, and that was also my GPA for high school. And I'm and also, and I'm a student athlete, too, and I just right. want, and I'm here to show that it is possible. Right. It's, it's not impossible to, because Hawaiian language is my strong language, and I also know how to speak English. And it gets difficult at times, but it gets easier and easier every every day and going to school learning in English it's strengthening my lang my English language too and I just yeah. want to add on to Kamale what Kamale is saying so our, our children like I said earlier is we're raised in Hawaii and um, our our son is like three years older or two years older in Kamale and he's he's graduating this semester from UH Manoa with two BAs one in Hawaiian and one in English. When he when he tr he his his academic career started in immersion, and he kind of hit the ceiling a little bit in the in in his school, mm -hmm. and so we decided to test him for other schools, mm -hmm. and you know he ended up going to Kamehameha, mm -hmm. and he went straight into AP English. No trouble with English, obviously. Yeah. And for those so, of you who don't speak English, that's advanced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he, he went straight into that. And, and and now he's getting his BA in English. And like his first semester, first year in um, as, a, as an English major at UH, they brought him into tutor. Nice. Mm. Wow. So his command of language, language. His, com his language capacity is, f I think, far greater than your average child because he was raised bilingual. Right. Mm -hmm. What, cognitive something? I don't yeah. Know. Hey, we yeah, his cognitive, yeah, his, his cognitive, cognitive capability, his, yeah. his cognition around language is, yeah. is pretty good. And we it's find great. that if you speak a second language of any kind, right? Or yeah. if you play a musical instrument, that, yeah. that your brain works better you when you have more. The brain <laughs> talk a little bit, about, I'm, I'm gonna talk about, about his son, because, uh, because uh, we're talking about Hawaiian identity. Oh, yeah. And if you think about it, as a human being, when your identity is basically stripped away or, 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 over, over generations of, 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 of history, language taken away, your, your religion is bad, you're bad people, you're you know, all this, and you end up as this, as this hollow core of nothingness. And then you are trying to emerge into a world that really is, is very foreign to you and not really succeeding well. What the, the, the restoration and the revitalization and rejuvenation and normalization of Olelo Hawaii does, especially for those who are of this aina, whose kupuna's bones are in this in the in the sands of of, of Hawaii, the the uh, the identity to make you stand tall and know who you are, and it's not that you're better than anybody, but it, it's it's that you remember things that you never knew or that your kupuna almost forgot. But you go back and you learn their names and what their names mean. And then you walk around Hawaii, uh, and that's what we do today, like we own the whole place. That's how we look at it. I mean, how I look at it. <laughs> be, uh, because we, we kind of understand the things that are going on. So it's not a, a, to be exclusive in any way, but the restoration of strong identity as, as a Hawaiian, as a, as a uh, uh, as a kama aina, and for anybody who's, because we have generations of people who've lived here who are not necessarily of Hawaiian language, but we all learn to speak Japanese, a little Filipino, a little, you know, all these different languages along the way because we've all come together. But everyone at one time was speaking Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. What, you know, people kept praying in Hawaiian is just more I think the identity issue is, right. is critical here, mm -hmm. and I think that is what the, the mm -hmm. Kamale generation, the, my son Kaipu, mm -hmm. and those, and the, the generations, uh, the generation that's coming out of the, the uh, immersion schools now is, mm -hmm. they know that they are Kanaka Maori, mm -hmm. that they are Hawaiian. And they, 
they don't question that at all. Unlike, yep. unlike say, like my upbringing, probably mm-hmm. other, mm-hmm. our upbringings, mm-hmm. you know, where we were just like, oh, yeah, Hawaiian is something on our birth certificate. Mm-hmm. Oh, we can get monies from Kamehameha to go college. <laughs> you know, whatever, there's, there's just some bennies to having mm-hmm. that on your birth certificate. However, it, we didn't have that, the, 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 mo- the moly within us just, uh, what is that, the inner, your inner life, that, yeah. that, that yeah. fire within Night you bur- burning and just, keeping you going. So what the Hawaiian does is it really sort of ignites you in that in that sort of way. And you have the mahalo um, kula nui o hilo, so hilo uh, kahaka ulo kelikolani and the ahapuna naleo for really um, articulating that in their mission mm-hmm. plan and, and such and, you know, bringing that because, you know, it's really, it's really about knowing who you are mm-hmm. as a kanaka today. And we're, we're not trying, you know, we're not trying to go back in time right. at all. What we're trying right. to do is go forward with Olelo Hawaii and, and see what does the Kamale do when she's 40? Right. You know, the, does, does, does Kamale's children speak Hawaiian? Mm-hmm. You know, does my grandchildren speak Hawaiian? Do my grandchildren and her children speak Hawaiian together? And we're, we're trying to set up a situation where that happens. Mm-hmm. And then that way, all these things we're talking about, accessing who we were as a people so that we can define who we are now and who will be in the future is really secured through these acts. So we have to be better than our teachers were. We have to be, and then we need to set it up so that our children, our, the next generation of scholars or whatever who come through are better than us even. So we have to- well, let's talk about sort of the institutional support. Uh, Lynn in Waikiki writes in, Hawaiian Airlines recently flew several flights in Hawaiian language. Is the panel aware of any other corporations planning to integrate Olelo Hawaii into their operations? I know that, for instance, if you go to Bank of Hawaii and you mm-hmm. uh, on the ATM, um, what, what does that do for the resurgence of the language? There was, a, there was an event in, on June uh, 29th of, 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 of 2018, of the 50th State Fair, and it was called oh. Kanivala. Oh, yeah. On that evening, it was Po Olelo Oahi Ahi Olelo Hawaii. Oh, and, 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 take, and, and this is where normalizing a language up, you know, beyond the, 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 the institutions or the, uh, you know, those kinds of things in the, in the, in the larger community, uh, a whole evening where everything was done in Hawaiian. 4,000 people experienced the 50th State Fair, you know, buying cotton candy, eating pizza, going on the Ferris wheel, listening to the entertainment all in Hawaiian as a way to bring, and people were just amazed at how, at how much fun it was. And, mm-hmm. and maybe sharing some English along the way to bring people in, but I think that's an example. But Hawaiian Air, I think, is a, is a wonderful, uh, la'ana, la'ana yeah. is a word for example. example. An example of that. I don't, off the top of my head, know of other entities that are out there doing that. I mean, there are other um, corporations, like Manu did say, though, Kamehameha has done so much internally there with their staff. I think people Mandate. automatically might think that that's not a big deal, but it is a huge deal. Well, here's one, the, oh, the Aulani, the Aulani, Aulani Resort. Yep. Aulani, oh, yeah. uh, they have an, an, an uh, you know, a, a, a Olelo, Hale Olelo, or the Olelo mm. Bar, Olelo, Olelo bar. Restaurant Olelo in bar. there, yeah. where they are encouraged, and they're, and they're, and they're actively hiring, hiring people who have Hawaiian language capacity, but in that particular restaurant in the, on their property, uh, encouraging people and for the guest experience, and that that's a part of it too. You know, part, a lot, a, a big part of the, the the survival of our whole being has to do with ho'okipa, and we've kind of forgotten that. But why not welcome people in Hawaiian properly, mm-hmm. you know, and and and, uh, and feed them and and and, and, t- and tend to them and care for them and and you know and, and be respectful of them. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that the tourism industry hasn't bought into the revitalization of Hawaiian. Yeah, some, in, some in, have. You some, know, in the sense some of like really, have. really supporting uh, Hawaiian language efforts in, in say, like getting masses of people to speak Hawaiian because I think it's it's very attractive. Yeah, it right. really it adds to the tech right. to the to the texture. Yeah. Uh, of our of our society, but it's just not just language though. It's cultural practice of whole that comes up. with. But when you have the, the thing about that, and I'll, cause I, because I was able to to be a part well, of Royal Hawaiian Center while, yeah. in in, uh, in at, at Helumo and Waikiki. But what, and, and this is a, it's not a criticism; it's an observation because in that in in that industry, oftentimes today you have Malihini greeting Malihini. 
So, in other words, visit, uh, or, or uh, uh, people who are not, people from, are here not from here are the ones who are greeting the ones who are not uh, who are not from here either. So, where is the Kupa Aina? Kupa Aina. Where are the residents? Where are the people who are from the Oivi? You know, where where is that relationship in that true Hawaiian hospitality? Uh, hospitality is not limited to Hawaii because right. because we all travel all over the world and we love experiencing great hospitality in other places but sometimes we don't even know how to give it because we forgot how or other people are representing us and hey how's about a Mai Tai and you know <laughs> hey shaka bro and that's about it that's all they do. One really quick last comment on what you were talking about as it relates to that question from Lin and Waikiki about the use of Olalo in business I think which is something I thought about when you, your last comment there should be, or corporate, I think corporate Hawaii should look at, at it as an opportunity for putting forth a competitive advantage. You know that, especially in the visitor industry. If people come here, there are, I'm gonna say it, there are beautiful beaches everywhere. You know, and there's some amazing ones here. People come here for the weather, but I would proffer that they also come here for this thing that Manu's talking about, this sense of Hawaii and what this place is. And so you would assume that corporations throughout Hawaii would want to own that and claim that and show that in their operations and what they do. And I think that's an opportunity there to embrace Ola Hawaii and use it even more. We have only a few minutes before our discussion mm -hmm. ends and I want to make sure that I hear from each of you. I know it goes fast. Um, I, I, but I would like to, to end asking each of you where you hope, what, what you hope is next. Now that there is more of a solid foundation for Hawaiian language in Hawaii, What's the next step? So we'll start with you. Well, I think that the next step is people actually believing in the language. Um, like going to an immersion school, we didn't have as much resources. Like we didn't have the same resources as all the other public schools. And I think that comes with mm -hmm. people believing that mm -hmm. people can be educated or people can be successful in life with the Hawaiian Foundation. And that's my, my hope is for people to believe and I think that if everyone believes that that is possible, then would, they would like parents would raise their children in Hawaiian at home, and people um, and Hawaiian native Hawaiian language schools will have more resources, mm -hmm. like other schools. And I think it just, com just comes to people believing and trusting in the language of our land. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think. I've been I've been looking at this topic for a little while, and I've been fortunate to to study well not study do some research as mm -hmm. we may call it in in Aotearoa, mm -hmm. and I've been and I've seen some things that work down there. For example, they have a language. Well, they have two language commissions. Yeah. Uh, they had an original one. I'm sorry, I forget the name of it. And they used to provide funding for initiatives in Te Reo Māori, and now they have Te Mātāwai, who's... Te Tarawhiri, oh, yeah, come on. Oh, Te... Te, te Tarawhiri. Te Tarawhiri, yes, and that's the original one, and Te Mātāwai is, mm -hmm. is the new one, man. Te Mātāwai really gets into the community, yeah. Yeah. puts puts funds into communities so that communities can revitalize Te Reo Māori mm -hmm. in, their, in their iwi, as they call it, in their mm -hmm. tribes. So I think what we need is a true language commission for Olelo Hawaii, for Hawaiian language. Uh, and I and I don't necessarily think that it's the it's an issue of the state. I believe it's mm. an issue of it's a federal level issue because if we think about the the reasons why Hawaiian is in the state it is today, it's really because of the United States presence and their their subjects we used to call them their subjects and how they um, how they've. And what they've done so that. Uh, I'm just, just saying. That is a very interesting no, thought. We, we have, have two minutes left, so I'd I uh, love yes, less so than two minutes left, so I want to make sure I'm here for you. Too. I'm yes. going to pick up off of what Kalika was talking about in terms of. So, the to me, one of the valuable things that has come out of Te Taurafiri and Te Matawe is this. The notion of a long range kind of a, a plan. Where are we going? What are we? A lot of the questions that are asked tonight, in terms of the future, a lot of things that other people in the community, business community, ask is like, okay, so what's next? How do we engage? And so I think even something as simple as that, coming up with some kind of a long range plan about what can be done more 
in terms of education and better resourcing of the Papahana Kayapuni, but in all of these other sectors, you know, where we are here in Hawaii, what can be done? What can we do to encourage language use? And what can people and entities in those sectors do? May indeed oh, help. Just something, some kind of a long range plan. So, me on a more mundane level, I'd like to see <laughs> Kane Ohe not ever again be Kanyohi. Yes. Kane Man Ohe Bamboo. I'd like to see Kapi'o Lani, <laughs> P.O. Arch, the Arch of Heaven, Kapi'o Lani, never be Kapialani again, because that is the Mika Ike Ole Oka Oka Mea. Well, it goes back to what you were saying about each of us having the responsibility mm -hmm. to learn our place, learn go our look. street name, and we'll start there. Check them, go, check them, go. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight. Of course, we thank our guests, Manu Boyd, cultural consultant, Amy Kalili, director of Makuola Honua, Global Center for Indigenous Language Excellence, Kaliko Baker, assistant professor at the Center for Hawaiian Language, and Kamale Krug, Hawaiian Immersion School graduate. Next week, right here on Insights, Rapid Ohia Death, a devastating problem on two islands that is killing sacred trees and seems to be getting worse. Please join us. We'd like to close tonight with a clip from Anne-Marie Kirk's, Kirk's film, Ola Naivi, celebrating 30 years of Hawaiian Immersion Schools. I'm Yenji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho. Hawaii.